Uh, hello, today we have Duncan Saunderson, who is the producer of uh, James Bowman's last album, uh, known as uh, Songs and Sorrowful Sonnets, which is released on April the 7th on digital. Um, it was subsequently released originally in uh, 2015 on CD, but of course, these days, no one listens to CDs, so we have to put it out on digital. So, Duncan, uh, welcome. Uh, can I just ask you um, how you how you come, came across James Bowman and uh, uh, your, your background with him? Yeah, well, because I was singing it, uh, in the choir of New College in Oxford, um, I met James a few times, and it sort of coincided with me putting a, um, a, a quartet together. We called ourselves Leader Tafel, and we wanted a few little breaks in our concert. So I, I sort of um, very nervously asked James whether he might come and sing some lute songs for us um, in between the, uh, the four part songs. And uh, he said, yes, he'd be absolutely delighted. So he came up and we did about um, half a dozen gigs, mostly in Wadham Chapel. So we then both decided it would be absolutely wonderful if he could record a, a recital of lute songs in the New College Anti-Chapel, of course, New College, where he started his singing as a countertenor in the 1960s. So um, to make a recording of lute songs in 2011 gives that lovely sort of full circle magical feel. So you originally did some recording with him back in 2011? Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, our, our album, uh, that leader title album called Paradise on Earth, includes James singing uh, three, four, maybe five um, tracks, which he sings absolutely beautifully. Accompanied which we... by Dorothy Linnell, a very mm -hmm. fine lutenist, and she incidentally is playing on a rather distinguished lute made, made in the 1960s by Morris Vincent. That was originally owned by the great lutenist Robert Spencer. So that lute would have accompanied not only James Bowman, um, with Robert Spencer, but also Alfred Della, the other great countertenor legend. So, so the lute has a bit of a uh, bit of interesting history there. We probably need just Yeston Davis now to to play with it, and then that will be the yes. Track. Good point. Absolutely. So um, you did this original recording, and then uh, a few years later, uh, it looks like you went for the whole uh, repertoire of James. Yeah. It, it just seemed it, it just seemed a crime not not, not to have him recording um, uh, 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 lute songs in the anti chapel at New College. A really beautiful acoustic down there, particularly when it's when it's empty when there are, when there are no people. And um, one of the great joys about it, there was an awful lot of love that went into it. Uh, we didn't have a big commercial company sort of um, over our shoulders with the meter on, so we could take lots and lots of time. James was very um, relaxed, and if the whole thing crashed, it was no big deal. Um, we had lots of lots of laughs and lots of clearings of the throat and glugs of water and time off. I think we did about um, five, maybe six hours um, over two days. That, that that's about six hours times two. Um, so it gave us lots of um, lots of space. Lots Still of pretty swift. Time. I mean, that's pretty, quite a fast pretty, recording for 18 pretty, tracks or pretty something. Pretty swift, but yeah, mm -hmm. but pretty swift, but on, on, only two people. Um, so, and, and he knows the stuff so, so well. And, and James has always been somebody that could do a take in one. Um, yes. I mean, he'd, he'd, I mean, normally he'd do sort of three, four, five takes maybe. Um, and then we could use the best one or do a bit of editing. And it just it just worked, but he was only singing really for sort of half the time. Did I ask about the repertoire that he chose? Do you know what drove that repertoire, and why did he choose any any insights there? Well, um, I I think he 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 established a really good connection with Dorothy Linnell, um, and he he also felt very comfortable with her. You know, again, a lovely sort of mumsy and and uh, and a wonderful sense of humour. And we all sort of worshipped James, and and that that sort of brought out the best in him, of course. Um, so I think it was just sort of highlights from their many many recitals. So lots of um, lots of of uh, Dowland, of course, uh, Gibbons, um, some lesser known composers, um, ending on uh, ending up with a, um, a a later composer, Henry Purcell, 
and uh, uh, my idea, incidentally, of uh, Thomas Tallis's Onata Lux, that makes a really magical solo song. Yes. Really beautiful. What's interesting, he's taken what might be classic songs for choirs and made them into solo. So um, I think when rising from Bread of Death or um, Green Sleeves, for example, yes. uh, and the Silver Swan, you know, the, yeah, all the, yeah, all yeah. the, uh, the songs that Leonardo yeah, looks, yeah. he's actually made them his songs effectively. Yeah, that, that, that's right. And I think very authentic, uh, that, that phrase, apt for voice or viol. I think you could, you could uh, have any combination you like. There's another countertenor, a Spanish countertenor, called Carlos Mena, and he's recorded a whole disc of Victoria motets, um, literally for solo voice and lute, and very nice it is too. So um, James really was obviously enjoying this, and, and, and it's his last oh, yeah. full album yes, yes. Uh, that we're aware of, isn't it? I think so. Um, having said that, um, there might be one or two. Um, out I think there. The, Thus Angels, for example. Yeah, that's that's the one I was thinking of with some mm. music by Malcolm Archer, mm. I think. Yes, yeah. Mm. But it was certainly one of his swan songs. No what pun kind intended. Of, I mean, you, you mentioned he was in quite a good good mood doing this. I mean, very good what, mood, yeah. Yes. Was he just happy? I mean, being back in New College, perhaps where he started out? He was extremely happy. And to have that, have the chapel to himself and a very, very friendly, tame lutenist. Um, and, and Sally is, is very relaxed. And uh, again, going, going back to that thing where there wasn't some big commercial meter on and, and, a, and a bunch of sort of shark-like um, sort of producers in, in, in sort of uh, suits uh, made, him, made him very comfortable. Excellent. And Sally Prime, uh, who recorded it, I mean, what, what's her background and how did you come across her, how, you know, she's not well, a stroke professional uh, recordist, but she's a good amateur, I guess. Yeah, um, I mean, she, she's, she's one of my singing buddies. Um, she's a scientist, so she's got all the, all the tech savvy. Um, she's a very, very keen singer and musician, loves the repertoire, and she has the uh, funding for some very, very good equipment, and really first-class equipment in terms of microphones, but also editing facilities. She's got a dedicated studio uh, where she lives. And, you know, it's it's sort of verging on the, the sort of the bridge and the enterprise in Star Trek, that sort of thing. And she can she can do all, all sorts of stuff with it. And she's clever enough to create her own um, recording label. So that, that, that all worked very nicely too. And again, when we were editing, uh, well after the recording there was no pressure in terms of time and money and all that sort of stuff just just love and enthusiasm yes and, and that, that that's map room recordings which is her her label and that's i think right. she, as you say she's probably recorded another counter 10 i think nick clapton yeah I, th I think she's mm. she's made a disc for um nick clapton and i think she's done some choral music as well mm -hmm. so very she's good building up building up a bit of experience. Yes, but I mean, on the one hand though, I mean, although you can edit noises out and things, but I think James's voice is unadulterated in the sense that there's not a lot of technical gizmos on it or reverb or any anything particularly that you'd use in a full- Oh, oh, oh no, it's, it, it's a completely natural yeah. natural sound. Um, it's authentic, I think, I think James. Sound, I think the sound and the balance is pretty good, actually. I think we've got the microphones mm -hmm. in a good, a good position. And leading oh, into that, I mean, yeah. you were the you were the producer. I mean, uh, what what is producing James Bowman mean? I mean, how, how what what did you do? Well, um, I mean, basically, I, I was just the extra pair of ears um, that, that could hear of, of things that, that that they might not be able to hear in terms of um, ensemble, the odd uh, note, sort of the, where the tuning could could have been a little bit better, um, that sort of stuff, and just to sort of. Um, steer the whole thing towards the end product and to keep James and Dorothy, you know, as, as, as happy as possible, really. I think it just takes somebody sort of sitting out where the audience sits just to sort of tweak the odd thing. But James and Dorothy are both people that, that can do it, can do a take in one. But obviously they, they just want a collection of takes and uh, to see which is the best. Always good to get a third party eye, an objective eye, isn't it? On Yeah. On well, it, 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 to it reassure the happens with everybody uh, absolutely absolutely yeah.
what what i mean i know the cd came out and it was relatively um low key but now we're putting it out on digital and everyone listens to that what would be your hopes for this release which incidentally it's got three of your leader tackle tracks on as well so there's 21 tracks on it yes but the, uh, when you say leader tackle tracks you mean the the quartet tracks or the the tracks that james recorded for us the three, the three tracks that james uh uh, yeah. Okay. So solo traps on on, yeah. on the on the leader yeah. disc. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Well. Um. I think he sings them extremely well, and I, I think I think it shows his his mature sound uh, really very nicely indeed. Now, when James started singing, and you can hear this when he was singing with the choir of New College in the nineteen sixties on some recordings, his voice was was really brilliant, and and really sort of pe penetrating, very steely. Very trumpety, very shawm like. Well, um, I was standing in front of, of him. Sort of reedy <laughs> sound, and you were standing yes. in front of him as a child. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was unbelievable. You're exactly right. It was very uh, shawm like, but fantastic. The glottal stop almost yeah. sometimes as well. Very yeah. interesting. And, and, and then, of course, he was the um, the, 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 the perfect um, counter tenor to sing with David Munro's. Um, early music consort of London that used all those instruments mm. and part of David Munro's genius was to get James to produce that incredibly trumpety um, steely reedy sound uh, that had that sort of sheer sort of upper partials sort of brilliance it, it um, was very complex cut, cut, cut through everything mm. but then but then the sound changed it was like a sort of wine and it, it sort of changed with the with, with with the years, and I think these two recordings, the leader tafel disc, with him singing four tracks, I think, and songs and sorrowful sonnets, shows his mature sound, and it, it turned into something much much more complex, you know, very much like a sort of fine wine, sort of sort of layers. Yeah, yeah. Sort of, it sort of sounded sort of macerated in something extremely rich. And, you know, there was a touch of um, Tokai wine, uh, the king of wines, they call it, with, um, with, with an element of what they call noble rot, should we say. Uh, <laughs> and um, it just gave the sound this incredible sort of depth and breadth and complexity w without maybe that sort of incredibly youthful brilliance to the sound that was, that was still there in the background still there in the background my, but it my, turned into something some, something much much softer yes and uh, sort of slightly more mellow and, more and, and the whole that the whole, the, the, the whole instrument came out of this almost freakish bass voice you know his, his speaking voice and his laughing could probably be heard at the other end of king's cross station during the rush hour you know when, when he was talking sort of sotto voce it's just a it's just a sort of freak voice and that freak bass voice singing in falsetto but with his very refined phrasing and expressivity like expressivity with with, with the words uh, was was all, almost addictive for, for some of us <laughs> indeed his use of words was remarkable actually um just also yeah. to say I, I know we're going off piste here a bit but um the David Munro work I thought was exceptionally good, innovative, and he had Incredible. flexibility, agility, and the rhythm there as well. I yes. think in a way he was absolutely at a peak at that time, and yet he actually wants to be known more as an opera singer. Funnily enough, um, he kind of glosses over the David Munro work. Yes. I think was amazing actually, and uh, still sounds fresh today. Any any thoughts on that? Well, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it was so, um, I mean, David was, was an absolute genius. He must have been an incredible perfectionist because you, you, you listen from the beginning of an album right to the end and, and, and the, the sort of um, architecture of it is absolutely amazing um, in terms of the, 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 the different tempi and the different um, styles and things. Um, I think James is probably just being very, very modest about his work with... Of course, that that's another side to James's personality. He's an incredibly sort of modest, down to earth guy. But I, I totally agree that his work with the early music consort of London, the David Munro, was was just sheer genius. Mm. And of course, he was a very sociable person. He actually loved singing with people. 
um, yes. laughed, the laugh, w- wicked sense of humor, naughtiness, all yes. sorts of things. very funny. Um, that's you know, you've got this beautiful melancholic beauty coming out of him, and on the other hand, you've got this almost ribald hilarity. Um, yes. interesting, slightly sort of medieval almost, um, in his sense of humor, um, very <laughs> earthy, shall we say, um, and a, a little bit unpredictable, also. That, that rather nice anecdote I, I mentioned to you, um, I was driving a friend of mine up to the church and a friend of mine was uh, was able to sit in um, just for fun to the sessions. And I was explaining to my friend that James is is, is wonderful, um, fantastic singer, etc. But he's, he's very modest and, and very humble and, and he's, he's not going to mention that he's done so many <laughs> recordings. He won't even mention that. And then as we got out of the car, James was getting out of his car behind us. And the first thing we heard in this great roar that you could hear the other side of King's Cross Station was, this is my 189th recording. <laughs> <laughs> I think the whole of Summertown heard it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and something that sticks with me was he had all sorts of nicknames for people. Um, very, oh, oh, God. I mean, if there was no someone in the choir who was under par, they'd absolutely have a... Extraordinary name, and I remember him calling Pet Shop Trelawney. Uh, the the day the DJ is at Pet Shops playing the music this morning or something. And <laughs> yes, lovely names for people. I can't, I can't, well, some people are still alive, I can't really repeat them, but um, um they right. were yeah. extraordinary under par people at New College Choir in the 60s, and uh, they would they would have all sorts of nicknames which are extremely funny. Y- yes, yes, he just put everybody at their ease and he, he just wanted to get a sort of belly laugh out of out of people. But he was also very good with sort of quiet people. You know, if there was a sort of shy person in the room, he'd mm. make a bees line, a bees line for them, and, and um, jolly, jolly them along. He was so incredibly generous. Always with, with helpful his, to younger musicians. Song. I think we saw him at his 80th when he gave a talk to uh, the people at New College, and a lot of the students were there. And he actually addressed the students all the time, which was particularly, yes. uh, you know, generous of him. I thought, and very. Un- yeah. Um, you know, pretentious. An, an incredible way with people. And, and it, it always seemed, it always felt incredibly genuine as well. Such a such a lovely, generous, kind, funny man. Absolutely. Very, hum- very humorous indeed. Well, Duncan, um, just to say Sorrowful Songs and Sonnets comes out on the 7th of April on all digital yeah. platforms. So we'll have that on repeat, I guess. Yes, and by the way, some lovely programme notes by Dr Andrew Gant, who teaches okay. at St Peter's College in Oxford. He's written some uh, some books. They're very, very good. Um, and uh, he just kindly contributed these uh, beautifully written programme notes. I think but he's the, a bit the, of a medievalist, actually, on, on the quad. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, the last... I mean, James's last song on this is um, Evening Hymn by Purcell. So uh, a- Andrew's final paragraph ends with, um, even as that great voice prepares to veil its light and bid its various musical worlds good night. Nice bit of uh, Purcell thrown into the last sentence. On that note, Duncan, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Pleasure. And, uh, I'll be seeing you soon. And thank you, everybody, who might be watching this. Thank you, Ashley. Bye.